Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And Jesus was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. If you walk into the supermarket at the moment, what are the first things you see? Stacks of flowers, piles of chocolates, fluffy pink hearts, bottles of champagne. You don't need to see anything else. You know, St. Valentine's Day is upon us. Those symbols of love tell us everything. Our story today from Mark's Gospel is Mark's account of the Transfiguration, and that is just packed full of symbolism. For a start, it takes place up a mountain. In the Old Testament, a mountain was a place where you met with God. Think of Moses and the burning bush in Mount Horeb at the beginning of Exodus. Think of Moses again receiving the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai. And then in the book of 1 Kings, there's the story of Elijah meeting God again up the mountain of Mount Horeb, hearing God's voice, that still small voice after the earthquake, after the wind, after the fire. A mountain is a place in the Old Testament where people encountered God. But the symbolism doesn't stop there. Jesus's clothes are described as being dazzling white, whiter than a human person's clothes could ever make it. Again, there's a symbol of the divine. Think of Jesus after his resurrection, where he is clothed in white. White represents a holiness and a colour not accessible to humans. And then thirdly, there's the appearance on the mountain of Moses and Elijah. They are two major, if not the most important, prophetic figures in the Old Testament. And them being there on that mountain is something, again, beyond the bounds of human possibility. And lastly, there's that overshadowing cloud on the mountain, again, a symbol of God. Because in the Exodus, again, a cloud led the people, led the Israelites through the wilderness towards the promised land. All in all, anyone with the faintest knowledge of Jewish history, of tradition, of Jewish scripture, would have realised that something is up, that something significant is happening in that passage in Mark's Gospel. All these things work together to dramatise the identification of Jesus with God's own majesty. Of course, the people who were hearing the Gospel for the first time, the Jewish people, and for us, were already aware of Jesus's divine glory. The transfiguration, though, intensifies it rather than informs or challenges us. But for those disciples, those three that Jesus took up the mountain, it was another matter. It was a, a wow moment. First time they'd encountered that because they hadn't been at Jesus's baptism. And I guess they wouldn't have known what to think, to say, how to react. But there was always one disciple who was prepared to fill the silence, Peter. And he offers to build three tents, one for Elijah, one for Jesus and one for Moses. It was like a commemoration of what had happened. The equivalent these days, I suppose, would be taking a photo 
or a selfie. How many times have you been out somewhere special, a tourist attraction if you like, and seen people taking photos? There are even examples of some places where there is a queue of people waiting patiently at a scenic spot to have their photo taken. They stand there in what looks like isolation and there's this beautiful view behind them. People seem more interested in taking the photo than in soaking in the experience. Jesus had taken those three disciples up the top of a mountain to for them to experience something of his glory, a revelation of his majesty. And there was Peter, Lord, shall I build three tents? How do you think that feels? And into that time and into that place, God speaks. He says, this is my son, the beloved. Just those words that were spoken at Jesus' baptism. But then he adds, listen to him. Those three words are for the disciples. But I think those three words, listen to him, are for us too. Pay attention to Jesus, to what God has to say, to who God is. Celebrate it, yes, but don't just commemorate it because Jesus is our living, Jesus is our divine Lord. Jesus is the Son of Man, but he's also the Son of God, the Beloved, nothing else. Because when God had finished speaking, the disciples looked around and there was Jesus. No one else, just Jesus. In the midst of our struggles in life, our worries, our difficulties, God invites us to hold on to his son, our guide, our redeemer and our rock. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, Raise our expectations of what it means to encounter God, not just in this place, but in every place, in all of the places we shall be in the days ahead. Help us every day to discover something new about your ways and about what you want of us and change the way that we see the world and the way we act. Amen.